The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, creativity is as creativity does, and England swings like a pendulum do. The September e-Arctic front blasts in, and that bodes well for fall. Plus, we continue with our complete audiobook serialization of John Ringo's Under the Graveyard Sky. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain editor Tony Daniel. This time we have part one of a two-part interview with authors Lois McMaster Bouchold, Wynne Spencer, and Brendan Du Bois, all discussing creativity how to get it, how to use it, and how to keep it. This is a great look behind some great authors, mental curtain, as it were, and a chance to examine some of the basic processes they use to create the books that you enjoy. We also continue with our complete audiobook serialization of John Ringo's Under a Graveyard Sky. Now here's the news. Not to jump the gun, but the September E-Arcs are shooted up and ready for release very soon. But before we get to that, I want to announce that the winner of the Best Short Story Award for the Best Overall Story in the year's best military SF and space opera, that's a lot of bests, our excellent anthology that came out in June is Michael Z. Williamson for his story in the volume called Soft Casualty. I can now admit that I was kind of rooting for this one because I do think it's a fantastic story, very droll, and scary at the same time, rather horrific. It's science fiction, by the way, set in his Freehold universe, but from an interesting point of view. And it appears originally on the Bain.com front page, too. Mike got a plaque at Dragon Con, presented by editor David F. Sherarad, and a cool extra five Ben Franklins to warm the cockles of his bank account, too. Even though we know the winner, you can still read the dang anthology. It's got some really excellent stories in it, too. And David F. Sherrod is working on preparing the second volume, which will be out next June. And we have another award winner to announce, the second annual Bain Fantasy Adventure Award, which honors the best original fantasy adventure short story, was given out in August at Gen Con. The contest was judged by the Bain editorial staff, including yours truly, and guest judge, New York Times bestselling author and Monster Hunter International series creator Larry Correa. Congratulations to Jeff Provine, who won for his short story, Kiss from a Queen. That story will be available on the Bain.com website on September 16th, and then in the free short stories of 2016, that ebook at BainEbooks.com. So, out now in EARC is Rhythm of the Imperium by Jody Lynn Nye. This is book three in Jody's View from the Imperium, sort of G's in Space series. We talked with Jody about the previous volume last year on the podcast, and no doubt we'll have her on again in December. In the meantime, if you want the sequel to Fortunes of the Imperium, and you want it now, and you don't care if there are maybe a few typos, the e is now available to fulfill that need of your funny bone for more chuckles and guffaws. The Rhythm of the Imperium by Jody Lynn Nye, e can be got at BaneEbooks.com. Creativity, how to get it, how to use it, and how to keep it. A roundtable discussion with some great writers who ought to know, this time on the podcast. Art and beauty. We know they exist, but many a philosopher has run his or her boat up against the rocks of reason trying to find an explanation for them, an end in themselves or a means to some other end, such as survival. We do know that a great story that entertains and surprises us is a beautiful thing to read, and one essential component to making it beautiful is creativity. We want to see if we can figure out, or at least talk about, how good writers are able to do this time and time again. And with us are some good writers, uh, Lois McMaster Bujold, Wynne Spencer, and Brendan Du Bois. Hello, folks. Hey, Tony. Hey, Tony. Hi, Tony. Lois McMaster Bujold 
is the creator of the multiple New York Times best-selling Vorkosigan saga, featuring troubleshooter for Star Empire Miles Vorkosigan, also mercenary spy, sometimes detective, sometimes second fiddle player in a drama featuring another character who is uh, close to him. Lois is also the author of many other books and stories, both science fiction and fantasy. She has won three Nebula Awards and five Hugo Awards, four for Best Novel. Wen Spencer is the creator of the best-selling Tinker or Elf Home, I guess we call it, contemporary fantasy SF series featuring elves, modern-day Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, uh, man-eating plants, and lots more. It's in a crazy amalgam in a wonderful uh, universe. Plus, Wen is the author of other novels, such as one of my favorites out from Bain, Eight Million Gods, and science fiction novel Endless Blue. Brendan Dubois is the author of upcoming science fiction novel Dark Victory, a novel of the alien resistance, that's the subtitle, which will be out from Bain in January. This is uh, the first book in a series which deals with humanity fighting back against a massive alien invasion. Wow, Bain's never done anything like that before. And uh, Decimation of Earth. Brendan is also the creator of the longtime Lewis Cole mystery series and the winner of two Seamus Awards for his mystery fiction, which has appeared in such magazines as Playboy, Ellery Queens, Alfred Hitchcock's, and others. He's also a winner of the television game show Jeopardy. So, Lois, let's begin with you, if we can. Is creativity something real apart from craftsmanship? Is there something we can call creativity at all, or is it just sort of the epiphenomenon, the shine that the process of crafting a story produces? What do you think? Well, every writer has a different process. So, you know, only of mine and you know, not to anyone else's. For me, the making it up and the writing it down are definitely two different phases. Uh, the one is it's a thought stream, you know, the creativity part. It's the ideation. It's the thinking it up. Uh, it's that moving picture that I have in my head. And uh, when I get enough of that, I can sort of nail it to the page and chop it up and, and put it into some kind of order. And that's where the, you know, the more logical parts come in of, uh, of cognition. Uh, but it's always a feedback loop uh, because uh, unless you're writing a one-shot, one-burst short story, uh, it's something that you pick up and put down and keep returning to and keep turning over in your mind. So the process of writing itself shapes the further creativity, uh, and uh, and then it becomes uh, it becomes an ongoing thing until it hits a snag. Uh, but we can talk about that later yeah. <laughs> when you get to writer's block. Uh, so yeah, for me, for me, the the making it up and the writing it down are, are two different uh, things. What would you? I mean, I don't want to ask you for a strict like philosophical definition, but how would you define your creativity? I don't so much define it as experience. It, yeah. I experience it as a, you know, as daydreams, as uh, you know, thought stream. Um, so, uh, so if you know, if you've ever, you know, sat in your school thing and daydreamed about being somewhere else, doing something else, you're indulging in exactly the kind of creativity that you know the writers do. Uh, if you've ever watched a movie and you know, thought about it afterwards and reran it in your head with you know, with the variations that you would like, uh, then you're once again doing that exact creative thing that, that writers start out with uh, before they capture that thought stream and, and try to get it on the page. Mm -hmm. So, uh, when the same basic question, how would you define your own version of creativity as, as you experience it? Is it anything like Lois's? Mm, yes, a lot like hers. Um, I think that creativity is, is a two-part thing. Uh, one of it is just here's random inspiration. Um, the neurons fire, and you don't know where it comes from, and but you you love the fact that it happens. Um, and the other one is more of a mechanical applying what you know, um, and basically tying together threads and, and thinking about logic. Um, they've actually discovered that when they hook electrodes up to people who are meditating, that when they're meditating, um, they're using a higher functioning part of the brains, uh, one that we normally don't use. So the muse or the voice of God is actually tapping a section of your brain 
um, that you don't normally use. Um, so in writing, you know, you have a lot of people talk about the muse talking to them, or the character suddenly decided to do this. Um, but what it is is your own creativity, your own writer instinct. Um, but it's a very difficult to tap into those neurons. Normally, people have to train themselves how to meditate and such. Um, so it's kind of like your brain is whispering to you. So you have to, like, stop and listen hard to your own writer's instinct. And, um, and I think a lot that's where creativity comes from. And because it's so mysterious, like... Um, people assign it to um, something outside of themselves. It almost sounds like it's it's a part of you that is, um, it, it's another person within you. Brendan, do you experience uh, initial creativity this way, or how, how would you uh, talk about it? I think part of it for me comes from, I have an insatiable curiosity of, of so many things. I'm always interested in reading and learning new things. And I like what Lois said earlier, two things, was the feedback loop. When you actually start writing, you're almost like jump-starting the creative process. Other ideas pop up, other scenarios lend themselves. Other characters start saying, hey, I know you want me to do this, but really I should be doing this. And the other thing, too, is sort of letting that part of your brain sort of revel in daydreams and thoughts and processes. I've always said... Um, for me, creativity always comes down to those two words, what if. You know, what if something like this happened? What if something like that happened? What would be the consequences? Who are the people involved? What's the uh, outcome? A lot of times it's just letting the thoughts randomly you know, bounce off each other like some sort of brownie emotional molecules. One idea will, will start another one, which will start another one. And, of course, the challenge is to... to to sort of corral them into place and put them down on computer screen or paper. Well, it sounds like all three of you have have pinpointed t sort of two different moments of of creativity. There's the process creativity that's going on after you've you've had the initial sort of creative burst. Is that fair to say? The sure. process creativity. That's a good way of putting it. Yeah, mm -hmm. I will. I will go along with that. More or less, it's it's two different phases. Uh, Through in something Brenda said uh, triggered the thought uh, that there's you, you have to strike a balance between taking in new information and knowledge and experiences, which are you know the raw material out of which the ideas arise, and stopping for long enough to let the ideas actually arise. Uh, I'm finding this a problem in the, in the world of the internet, which will happily give you input 24/7 plus. Uh, that you know just Stopping and getting the time away to be bored and think uh, is, is another important phase. The vo this language, it arises. You have to give it time. Uh, it, it sounds like it's, it's somewhere else, but it's inside you, isn't it? I mean, where is this going on? How do you experience it? Um, and, and how do you make it yours? You're, you're talking to three experienced writers and... We don't have the necessity, um, the, um, the, we don't have the ability to sit and wait for it. Um, we always have to make sure it works because we, we've got deadlines. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that's the big mark between uh, people who are cranking out books and the people who haven't finished the book is the people who haven't finished haven't learned it. You can't sit and wait. For the process. If I can you jump in, Wen has made an extraordinarily important point. When I was starting out, people were saying, well, when do you write? When, does the, when do you feel inspired to write? And I would say, <laughs> my inspiration starts when my butt hits the chair, and I know i got to get some work done. I, I mean, it's a craft, and there's creativity, and there's art involved, but it is a job. It's a craft, and the, if you look at it that way, and you hone your skills and talent and focus, it'll pay off. As I said, you just can't wait for it to strike. You have to um, encourage it, plant it, grow it, grab it, but you just can't wait. You you have to go and do it. Yeah, there's a, there's a, another, you know, an interesting problem of balance between uh, perfectionism and getting something actually finished. 
Um, yeah. Because I, I keep telling well, myself the, the worst flaw any story can have is not to be finished. Keep that in mind. Uh, <laughs> keep going. Do something. Uh, I'm a little less deadline pressed now because I'm yeah you know, I'm on the on the retirement side of my career, but uh, certainly when I was younger that was a that was a big pressure. Let's talk about the stages of this then. The what about the the beginning stage? I, there's a lot of different story problems a writer faces beyond the blank sheet. But take the blank sheet first. Um, initiating a new book or short story. What do you think of the idea of the muse? Uh, or a psychological experience that it is a muse analog, sort of. Um, how does that first step happen for each of you? Um, okay, I don't find the concept of the muse particularly useful. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's yeah, you know, it's thinking st thinking stuff up, and I have to have I have to have three, actually four things to get started. I have to have a character with an initial situation or problem um, in some kind of setting. And it has to be one that is psychologically appealing to me because you know there's a million possible characters and you know with problems, but only only a very few of them are, are ones that that I get excited about. So you have sort of a template to begin with. Excuse me. You have sort of a template that you start with. Uh, Character, plot, setting, and I better like this. Uh, more like a sensation in my solar plexus. <laughs> Excitement or interest, you know, it's it's very somatic. You know. um, it's like, oh, this this is cool. This is the thing. You know, this is what I want to do something with. I may not know what yet, but uh, but it'll have a have a kind of an idea energy density, uh, and and that will be the idea of out of all the possible world of ideas, that's the one will be the one I'll start to focus on. And we'll start to think about you know the specific problems of the story, the character, their situation. I may go to research, directed research reading at this stage. Uh, for the novella I just finished earlier this year, it was like, you know, I came up with the idea, and then I went and read like four or five books on setting and background, which gave me lots of other ideas to steal, uh, and then started to put them together as, as the story. So that I'll have like pages, many pages of notes about the background, the setting, the characters, and then I'll start to come to focus in a scene, and then I'll start to outline the scenes and, and begin to write, and then continue to outline as I go. Another uh, feedback loop process. So the blank page is actually fairly far down the line in the, in the process. So. You've already um, you've already done a lot before you get to you get to that point. Um, yes. Yeah, I'm not. Uh, there are writers who you know sit down and and they they need that blank page and that's how they do it. You know, they do it kind of all at once, uh, right immediately in front of them. And I can't imagine how. But do you think that you spend more time thinking about a book before you write it than you do writing it, or by, what do you think the percentage uh, might be in general? Yeah, probably. Yeah, it's it's the tip of the iceberg thing. I'm not sure. You know, it's, whether this iceberg is ice or some other matter, but yeah, probably. The mass of written notes I will have will be at least equal to the text when I'm done. And the amount of time thinking about it is at least two to one. Hmm. Uh, then to actually writing. Uh, the writing is kind of like the end part. Uh, what about the uh, Wynn Spencer blank page, Wynn? Oh, my God. So totally different. <laughs> uh, I... I get I, an idea, and it's sometimes just a dream that wakes me up. And I sit down and I go. And I write, 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 write until the idea stops. And at that point, I start the feedback loop of what did I write? Where is it going? Where can it go? And I do a lot of rewriting. Um, but I'm a very messy writer compared to other people. Um, I, I've discovered that I can't really plot ahead of time because I overlook important logic steps in the characters. So I'll have the characters in a plot. If I plot it out originally, the characters follow what seems a very logical plot line to me. But when I get down to the sentence level, I realized this is a very different person than what I thought was originally, 
And so the logic doesn't stand up. Um, so then what, I, what originally was plotted out is no longer a logical path for them to follow. Um, and um, so normally I get the idea, I write until it peters out, and sometimes 10 or 15,000 words, like the first chapter of Tinker is 17,000 words, and I wrote that in two weeks, and that was all just throwing a book across the room going, no, 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 that's not how you do it, and sitting down the next day and writing. Um, and basically, what is there is what I wrote. Um, I did go back and change certain details, but, you know, and then I was stuck with the, okay, now I need to make this make sense, and that's where I start going back, and I wish I had a more logical order because I spend a lot of time um, flailing, um, but I, I've never been able to do the plot line and get it to work. And for me, that notes isn't so much, it's more like capturing thoughts so that I can remember it later because otherwise I will forget. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, not, it's not as formal as it sounds. <laughs> I think uh, for for me also it uh, goes back to my, when I first started writing, which was in a very disrupted environment. Um, uh, I didn't have time to do rewrites, uh, so I need to get it right right the first time, and that's where my you know, pre-outlining uh, first drafty pencil note thing came in because it made my actual sitting down writing time uh, more efficient because it had to be. So necessity is the mother of creativity, <laughs> in a way. There's a lot of, like, you know, the, the situations in which you were writing early on affect your process later, you know, even though the situation has changed. Leads me to uh, my writing process. I start off as a journalist, working as a newspaper reporter. So you're always under deadline. You always had to get it right, and you had to get it right and down on paper. So for me, the process... And I guess for every writer, you know, your mileage may vary. For me, it's an idea I have to be excited about, it's something that just compels me. Here's a story that has to be told. And then I dash off, you know, what's the story about? What's it involve? How would it end? And then the next step is, well, who are the characters? How are they in conflict? How would we go from there? And usually any typical outline for me isn't that long. I, I usually follow the, uh, the driving at night scenario where I know enough to get to the next chapter, and from there I sort of think ahead of what's going on in the next chapter. Uh, I always have a goal in mind. I always know where I'm going, but I always allow a lot of fluid, fluidity to allow me to explore different things and to let the story sort of organically grow. But the set of a blank page doesn't uh, scare me. In fact, it almost excites me in that there's a wealth of possibilities and choices to be made. Let's go for it. Let's, let's have some fun. You have written a lot of book, Brenda, and I can only imagine. I mean, you you can't uh, it it can't be a problem for you. Uh, I mean, you write uh, an uh, an amazing uh, amount, at least in my eyes. Fortunate in that I love what I do. There are bad days, there are slow days, but I am consider myself so fortunate. Every day I get to do what I want to do, which is sit in front of a computer and create character and you know different worlds. I mean, how blessed can someone be? I've <laughs> always wanted to be a writer since I was 12, and there's nothing else I'd rather do. And the stories just are out there for me begging to be told. Um, and I'm just, so far, I'm still in love with it, thank goodness. That's an interesting thought. Do any of you experience the um, the idea that um, that the stories are out there waiting to be told, that there's some sort of platonic realm of stories that you go to and grab that they exist? outside of you somehow, that you're discovering instead of inventing? No. It's too Not hard. particularly. Yeah. So Brenda's the only one that has the Platonist among us? <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> well, there's a world of the stories out there, and they, you know, they feed into your, your grab bag of possibilities. Mm -hmm. Almost every story idea doesn't start with one idea. It starts with several bouncing together, cross Cross fertilizing, yeah. So, you know, the more stuff well, you have in your bag, I'm the more chance I can. I'm liking with the whole um, 
road trip thing. I, I kind of see it as, you know, you plan the vacation to Disney World. You know you're going to Disney World. You know that's where you're going to end up. But there's going to be all these side trips that you didn't expect. And I guess when I say that um, I don't discover the stories that much is because I have – I. I know I would like to go to Bali. I, I know I would like to go back to Japan. I know I'd want to go here. I would like to go there. Um, and I have no interest in Iceland. It's just too cold. Um, so in that way, I know their stories I want to write, and their stories uh, I wouldn't start. So, so I'm not, I shouldn't wait on an Icelandic saga from you, Wim? No. So what is it sounds like all of you sort of in in at least a in, in some way have have dreamt up an ending when you start or that you know where you're going in 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 a pretty solid sense is that Yeah, you need to know where you're going. Well, I need to know. Is that I mean that's that's it's it coming up with the ending seems like a a huge creative step. It's, if you have the sunset in front of you that you know you're heading toward, um, does coming up with the ending, is it essential? I'm coming from a journalism background, I'm, I was taught, you got to grab them by the throat at the very beginning. So I really put a lot of effort into making those first words, those first chapters, grab a reader that they are compelled to find out what's going on. But there has to be a big time payoff at the end. You just can't let things flop around you've got to have a very strong ending to support your very strong beginning and hopefully equally strong uh, middle but yeah the ending is important you, you have to know what the resolution is going to be and and how it's going to get there and, and sometimes there are detours and rewrites along the way but overall i think having a pretty good idea of how it's going to end is pretty good I, uh, I agree with the importance of it. Um, for me, it's more a process of discovery. You know, I discover the ending as I write my way to it. Somebody described writing a novel as like eating an elephant one bite at a time. You know, I can't really see everything about the end until I get a lot closer to it uh, frequently. Where are you discovering it uh, from? <laughs> you, you said you're not, you don't think there's a world of stories out there. Where are you? What do you mean when you say discovering it? Where is it? My ending? Yeah, or the story, as you... Okay, it comes out of the process, yeah. As, as I write my way to it, new possibilities arise, old possibilities mm -hmm. close off, it comes to focus, it becomes clear. Um, you know, as the, the driving metaphor is a good one on that one. You, know, you can't see over the next valley, you can only see the next bit. But when you get over that next hill, there it will be. Well, that's a good, uh, I think, segue to the relationship of writing craft and uh, writing creativity. Um, are they like electricity and magnetism kind of pulling each other forward? It sounded like that in a way is, is um, might be a fair way to characterize it. How do you keep them in sync? With the whole road trip thing, for me, it's like you're starting out in Kansas and um, knowing where the ending is, um, tells you what direction you go. So if you're heading to Disney World, you know you need to go southeast. Um, it's not a definite, you know, you have to take this certain route. You just, that's a general direction you could go. And um, I think with your creativity, you, you set it, you're setting limits up for yourself. You know, you keep on putting up, no, we're not going to go west. We're not going to go north um, to channel it. But you're leaving yourself open um, for all sorts of, of uh, other decisions making, you know, a car breakdown, um, lost, run out of gas. You know, you've got all those options open up, but you're still, you're not going to end up in Alaska. Um so it, it's a, uh, at one time you free up your, your creativity to flow, um, but at the same time you're constantly putting blocks in the way going, no, I'm not going to go that direction. No, I'm not going to go that direction. Well, what about, I mean, is, is that part of, of, of craft 
um, coming into it. Uh, and is craft, uh, is it something that's sort of not creativity? It's something that's, that's more the logical side of things. Yeah, I think it's a much more, you know, putting rules onto the creativity is the craft. Um, I mean, you could be totally illogical, totally wild, and um, it'd be wonderfully creative, but it would also be a mess. And, um, and basically, you know, part of the craft is going, okay, no, we're not going to be, you know, just vomiting onto the page kind of thing. We're going to be selective and we're going to pick out what we're going to actually do. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to throw in something just exactly that, but you said it, so. Well, what is, how do you keep them in sync, Lois? Um, if if you're, you're crafting something and, and you need inspiration or you've got, you, you've gone as far as your ideas are taking you, and now you need to shape them. Um, how do you keep plugging along with, with both of them in sync, or do you? Well, the, yeah, just the fact that I am writing a novel gives me a, a structure, you know, uh, to uh, to hang on to uh, as I go. You know, I am writing a chapter, and then I am writing the next chapter, you know, which needs to have some relationship to the prior chapter, uh, and so on. So, so the uh, so the medium itself uh, provides some structure there. Uh, it also provides me with um, with manageable bites. You know, so I'm never writing a novel at one point in time. I'm, I'm writing a scene. You know, that's about as much as I can hold in my head at one time. And, and then I'm writing the next scene. And something I come up with, that, and that next thing scene may completely change what I thought I was going to do with the following one, and, and so on. You know, that's that's the, uh, the feedback loop effect. Uh, uh, if so, I can step in, Lois makes an excellent point. I'm writing a novel, but when I'm at the keyboard, I'm writing a scene, you know, or part of a chapter. If I were to sit down and say, I'm working on, I'm starting to work on something that'll take me a year or two years to write, I'd hide under the desk. It's such a scary proposition. But if you're saying, I'm going to focus on this scene and make it the best I can, that works. That, that works. And for me, when you talk about craft, um, that author, Malcolm Gladwell, said something about 10,000 hours of practice to do something well. And some people say he's exaggerated, but I think the fact that I've been trying to work on my craft almost every day since my teen years helps. And it helps also to nurture uh, the creativity as you're working. So one feeds off the other. Yeah. With the scene, you can be... You could turn on the taps for creativity and go full out. What, what's the most interesting location for this scene? What would be the most look, um, interesting um, thing going on in the scene? Um, what would be the most crazy next scene that it could segue into? So you, you have this, you know, a box, and you're turning on the creativity taps, but, you know, it's only for that short segment. So it's this fill it up, fill it up, fill it up. Um, and the, the scene structure gives it the bounds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, I've described it as like beads on a string. You know, one scene follows another like beads on a string. I've also described it as being like a slideshow. You have a slideshow that you know, is one scene after another and, and people connect them in their mind to a narrative and you know, construct the narrative that way. There's also that space in between the scenes that you, you don't show, but you have to like evoke and make, make the readers make it up for themselves uh, in their minds by, by what you've told them on both ends. And that's, that's an interesting thing to play with. You know, what's, what's not on the page that somehow you can get to rise in the in the reader's minds. So, uh, so it's uh, there, there's another factor in this process, and that's the reader or the reading. And mm -hmm. to a great extent, the words are being used to sculpture thoughts in the in the head of the reader as as they read them. And you know, you're not really in control of this, uh, but you do your best. That was part one of our Creativity Roundtable. 
with Lois McMaster Bujold, Wen Spencer, and Brendan Du Bois. We'll have part two and the conclusion next time on the podcast. Now we continue with our complete audiobook serialization of John Ringo's Under a Graveyard Sky. This portion of Under a Graveyard Sky is provided by Audible.com. Get the complete audiobook at Audible.com now. If you are not a subscriber, you can get the entire audiobook free or choose from more than 100,000 other titles when you try Audible free for 30 days. Now here is another segment of John Ringo's novel, of zombie infestation and the heroic humans who fight back, determined to pull the world from disaster and humanity itself from the brink of annihilation. It's all taking place under a graveyard sky. Chapter 9 Mr. Schmidt, this is my niece Faith, Tom said. Dave Schmidt didn't work for Tom. He was one of the building engineers, which was an entirely different company. But they were sort of friends. And if Tom didn't find someone to entertain Faith soon, all hell was going to break loose. And he was busy, damn it. It's a pleasure to meet you, miss, Schmidt said, his brow furrowing. It's nice to meet you, Mr. Schmidt, Faith said, waving instead of shaking his hand. Faith was being as close as she could come to being on best behavior. Given that not only had Uncle Tom divested her of all her weapons, most of her gear had been dropped in the security team's locker room. She didn't even have so much as body armor in a zombie apocalypse. There are some real-world reasons that I'd like Faith to have a thorough grounding in large-scale building design, Tom said. I know you have duties, but would it be too much of an imposition for Faith to assist you in them? There are regulations, Mr. Smith, Schmidt said uncomfortably. And we live in interesting times, Tom said, smiling broadly. Seriously, help a guy out here. I, Schmidt said, then shrugged. Sure, no problem. Thank you, Tom said. I owe you. Can we speak privately, sir? Schmidt asked. Sure, Tom said, waving for Faith to step out. They were meeting in the engineer's very nearly subterranean office. I, Schmidt said, then cleared his throat. I understand that Boda has access to vaccines, sir. That rumor was quick, Tom said, frowning. I'll neither confirm nor deny, but for the purpose of discussion... I'd really like to get some, sir, Schmidt said, his face working. My, my sister has already, she's in the confinement facility. I'm sorry, Tom said, sighing. Yes, you understand that it's a vaccine, it's not a cure. There's nothing currently that can be done for your sister. Yes, sir, Schmidt said, but I really don't want to be that way, and I have children. And grandchildren. I can't get a lot of doses freed up, Smith said, trying not to sigh again. I'll see what I can do. As long as you keep that Amazon out of my hair for a while. I heard about the security checkpoint, Schmidt said, chuckling. A sword? Seriously? Are you talking about the machete or the cookery? Tom asked. Yes, seriously. And okay, yes, I'll see what I can do. Just... Get her out of your hair for a while, Schmidt said, standing up and sticking out his hand. He pulled it back after a moment. Sorry, can do. Lots to learn, and I'm a pretty good teacher. Thank you. So this is it? Faith pounced as Tom left the office. You're going to turn me over to some fat old engineer to go dig around in sewers? Faith, Tom said, trying not to grit his teeth. There is, in fact, a real-world reason for this. What? Faith said. What can I possibly... Building design, Tom snapped. Where are we? I really have no clue, Faith said. I got lost a half an hour ago. Which is the point, Tom said. Let's say things really fall apart. That you have to do stuff that no reasonable 13-year-old would have to do to survive. 
You think that knowing how big buildings like this really work won't be useful? Well, Faith said, frowning. Also, I'm incredibly busy, Tom said. I'm the head of security for a major international bank that millions of people depend upon in the middle of an international crisis. Are you really so selfish that you think I should spend all my time pampering to your tantrums? Or that you should even be throwing them? I'm sorry, Uncle Tom, Faith said. I... it's just... This will keep you occupied and hopefully interested, Tom said, while I try to save as many people as I can. So yes, you're going to get an introductory course in building engineering, which is at least half about how to find your way around in one, which may just someday save your life. I understand and comply, Uncle Tom, Faith said. But what you're asking me to do is creep around the frankly creepy bowels of a building with, you know, people turning into zombies without any warning. This is not exactly keeping me safe, sir. You have a point there, Tom said. I'd planned on keeping you up at the executive level, where we have posted security. Just a couple of weapons, Faith asked. The problem is what? Tom said. Almost anything useful is illegal for carry by a miner in New York. I hate this place, Faith snarled, then got hold of herself. Sorry, but... I'll get you an issue baton, Tom said. But that's it. Better than nothing, Faith said, saluting. Reporting for duty, sir. Just don't get yourself turned into a zombie, Tom said. Your mother would kill me. I had no idea these buildings were so complicated, Faith said, as they were walking down another seemingly interminable service corridor. Every one of these buildings is basically a self-contained city, Dave said proudly. He'd found he enjoyed the girl's company. She might be a little firebrand, but she was a smart one, and willing to pitch in no matter what the weight. Strong as hell, too. She'd carried a 60-pound circuit breaker up two flights of stairs without a single bitch. More like a spaceship. Air has to be pulled in and pumped to everywhere in the building. Then there's water and sewage, movement of materials. It's a dance, really. A great one. What are those? Faith asked, pointing to some huge thingies. Air handlers again, Dave said. Currently, they're not running, since the portion of the building they supply isn't in use. No need for them. Nobody's using the air. And that is... Faith stopped and tilted her head to the side. What's that sound? Fluid flow, Dave said, cocking his head. Air flow? There's an electrical hum. I was thinking of the... She stopped at the shriek. The zombie had been behind one of the idle air handlers. It was covered in blood, not its own. Faith really didn't want to see what it had been feeding on behind the box. Charlie? Dave said, stepping forward. Charlie, it's me, Dave. Don't, Faith said, putting out her hand. It's not going to... The zombie charged the twosome, keening. It was the first time Faith had heard the zombie wail, and it sent shivers down her spine. That was the sound early man had heard in the forests. It was the thing in the corner at night, the monster under the bed, in the closet. It was fear curled up into a ball and distilled. For just a moment, she froze. No, Dave shouted, backing up. Charlie, no, 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 no. The zombie was fixated on the engineer, which gave Faith her chance. She whipped the baton into the zombie's shin as it passed. She could hear the bone snap from the blow, but it turned on her nonetheless. She captured one grasping hand in a come-along, lifted the arm, and spun under, tucking it up and back. The strength of the zombie surprised her, as did its complete disregard for pain. Any normal human would have been down on the ground with a broken leg and a nearly dislocated arm. The zombie just continued until it was fully dislocated, its teeth snapping to reach its tormentor. Faith drove the butt of the baton into the zombie's kidneys and was mildly unsurprised to get no result. It just didn't notice pain at all. With that understanding, she flipped the club out and up, then across, hard, 
on the upper part of the zombie's neck. There was a sickening crunch, and the thing dropped to the ground. Oops, she said, trying not to throw up. I think we're going to have to report this to Uncle Tom. I didn't mean to kill him, Faith said miserably. I just tried everything I could to subdue him and nothing was working. I know you're not supposed to use a baton on bone or the neck, but I couldn't think of anything else to do. She started sobbing. I'm surprised you could, the NYPD officer said, shaking her head. You gonna be okay, miss? Boda Security and the coroner's overworked office had already cleared the bodies away. As Faith had feared, the zombie had been feeding on a previous victim. Both of them had been support engineers working in the area. Faith was meeting with NYPD under the gaze of Boda's general manager for security and emergency response, as well as the chief legal advisor. The experienced attorney was more used to contract law, but he could dance the tune of criminal law. Juvie was, admittedly, not his expertise. Are you planning on charging my client? The attorney asked. She has cooperated fully. Given the situation and everything else going on, the cop said, it's up to the DA's office, but I don't think so. I'd find it unlikely. Thirteen-year-old girl defends herself and another person from an H7 EDP, and the EDP is killed in the process? With a stick? I'd say the Post would want to interview her, but not the DA. I think we'll try to avoid that, Tom said. If there's nothing else, we'd appreciate it if you'd keep her somewhere safer than the steam tunnels, the cop said, standing up. And she's going to need counseling. We'll get her the best available, Tom said. Chad, could you walk the officer out while I talk to my niece? Of course, Chad said. Officer? Are you going to be okay? Tom said as the others left. And feel free to say I told you so. Faith grunted a laugh and shrugged. I'd like to say the crying for the cop was all an act, she said tonelessly. And some of it was, but no, not really what you'd call okay. On the told you so, because among other things, I had to use a melee weapon. I'd planned on killing my first zombie at at least 25 yards, not where I could hear the bones crack and get blood all over myself. So no, not okay, okay? She sniffed again and grimaced. God, I hate that I cry. It's so girly. Think soldiers don't cry, Tom said. Think your father never cried? You cry. You cry usually when nobody's watching. You cry in the shower. Or only when friends are there. People who know. Who understand. And you didn't cry in the crunch. Go me, Faith said. I don't think there are really words for this. Tom said, shrugging. I can get you all the counseling in the city, but it boils down to you did what you had to, when you had to. If you hadn't, then two more lives would have been lost. One, Faith said. If worse came to worse, I was going to break Dave's leg and run for it. That's the spirit, Tom said, his hand over his mouth, trying not to laugh. I mean, even a 22, Faith said, throwing her hands up. That way I could have shot his leg out at a distance. Dives of the zombies, Tom asked. Yes, either, both. Well, you don't have to worry about it again, Tom said, shaking his head. I should have been smart and kept you up here in the first place. I'll find some paperwork for you to do or something. Great, Faith said, crossing her arms. For now, it's back to the apartment, Tom said. I've already called Dr. Curry and told him that Sophie's done for the day, and you definitely are. I'll have someone run you over. I, Faith said, then frowned. That's the only thing that makes sense. But I am not going to the apartment without my gear. Faith? Uncle Tom, she said reasonably. The next time I might not be able to say I told you so. I know you're running us over with executive protection, are they staying on the door till you get there? Um, Tom said. He had had a hard enough time finding the personnel to run them home. There were a million tasks. There are still criminals, Faith pointed out, and unknown threats. You're not going to leave us alone in the apartment without so much as a taser. Not this time. 
Agreed, Tom said, sighing. I'll have the security detail transport it. But no going zombie hunting. Been there, done that, Faith said. All I really want right now is a bath. And tomorrow, we'll find something else for you to do. Filing. It's going to be filing, isn't it? Miss, I'm really sorry about having to disarm you when you came in. It was the same security guard, and he really did look sorry. The story was already all over the building. You were just doing your job, Faith said, thumbing at Durante. He's supposed to tote all my stuff for me. Is there anything in there I can carry in New York? She'd had to turn over the baton to NYPD for examination, but Tom had helpfully issued her a new one. The guard leaned over and slid a taser across the table under the cover of his body. Drop this in one of your cargo pockets, he whispered. And if you do get in trouble, give me a call on the cell and I'll call a few buddies. Thanks, she whispered back. Sorry, miss, but as I said, all the stuff is illegal for carry in New York without a permit, he said loudly. He handed the tote with her weapons to Durante. Mr. Durante will hold on to it for you. I understand, she said loudly. Let's go, Gravy. Oh my God, Sophia said. She was in jeans and a t-shirt after working in the lab. She was starting to wonder if body armor wouldn't have been the best call. As they walked out of the building to the waiting car, a photographer ran up and started taking pictures of Sophia. Ow, Sophia said, turning away. He was using a heavy-duty flash and between her eyes not yet being adjusted. And the descending sun, it was like looking into a nuke. Hey, Durante said, stepping between them. Back off. Miss, can we get your name? A guy with a hand recorder asked. Are you the 13-year-old who fought off a zombie with a pair of nunchucks? What? Faith said. Out of the way, Durante said, pushing the guy back. But there were a dozen or more coming around the corner from the main entrance. He keyed his microphone. Unit 14, I've got a security issue at entrance 6. Request support. Just keep moving, girls. To the car. Move, you idiot, Faith said, body checking one of the mic-wielding reporters out of the way. Follow me, Soph. Watch out, Renacop, the reporter said, pushing back. I can get you charged with assault. You want assault, Faith said, pulling out her baton. Move or I'll show you assault. Just keep moving, Faith, Durante said, giving her a shove. Can you tell us what you were doing in the building? No, Sophia said, holding her hand up to shield her face from the flashes. What is your relationship to Boda? Say no comment, Durante said. No comment. Can we get your name? No. Was the afflicted hostile? You've got the wrong person. Damn straight, Faith muttered. More security poured out of the building, and with their assistance, Durante managed to get the girls to the car without actually injuring anyone in the crowd, which had grown to include the usual gawkers. New Yorkers would ignore anything except paparazzi, which generally meant celebrities. Is that Lindsay Lohan? Did she get arrested again? No, Sophia screamed as the door closed. Oh, crap, Durante said. Move it to the condo. If we've got trailers, see if you can lose them, but don't do a princess die. Rent a cop, Faith said, buckling her seatbelt. Rent a cop? They thought you were part of the security detail, Durante said, chuckling. Son of a bitch, Faith snarled. I make the tabloids, but I don't. You might want to remember what we're actually doing here, Sophia said, her face tight. Durante waved his hand to indicate it was not a subject for discussion. New York, Faith said, looking around at the unusually light afternoon traffic. I don't get the attraction. It stinks, it's crowded, the people are rude, and there's barely a scrap of green in the whole place. You wanted to come, Sophia said. Because it was better than being stuck on a sailboat, Faith said, but not much. The food's good, Durante said. He really didn't like New York much either, but he felt he had to come up with some virtues. And the girls are, there's a lot of art and culture. The girls are hot, 
Faith finished. Or easy. I'm not going to have this conversation with my boss's teenage nieces, Durante said. It's got its attractions. Of course, a lot of them are closed right now. Hang on, the driver said, swerving. A naked woman was running through traffic, hitting the cars as she ran, as if trying to push the traffic onto the sidewalk. Zombie? Sophia asked. Could be, Durante said. Probably, but this is New York. She could just be high. You don't know until you run a blood test. So about the food thing, Faith said, her stomach rumbling. We'll get you delivery, Durante said. One other benefit to New York. You can get any kind of food in the world delivered. I'm not really hungry, Sophia said. I am, Faith replied. I need food. And after an almost continuous diet of Mountain House, I need good food. Is there Italian? Best Italian in the world, Durante said. Better than Italy. Although mostly it's mom and pop places. But we can get some delivered. I just want to shower, Sophia said, looking out at the city. Another zombie. That's a zombie, Durante agreed. Two NYPD officers had the zombie restrained, but it was clear that he'd bitten a passerby. The passerby was a punk with a gigantic pink mohawk who was crying and holding his arm and appeared to be begging the officers about something. The officers didn't seem to be listening. And another one on the way, Faith said. Indications are that if you clean the affected bite quickly, the chances are reduced, Durante said. And they're saying now that if you get the flu, the secondary virus is reduced if you take potassium supplements. Yeah, the separation of the B-phase to lamarase site is inhibited by potassium, Sophia said. But it's not an either-or thing. If you take enough potassium to totally inhibit expression, it's a lethal dose. But if you have a strong immune system, then having any inhibition of the expression gives your immune system a chance to beat the beta expressor. If you have a strong immune system. And bites are tough. The beta expressor is aggressive and resistant. It's a matter of how much viral load you get through any source. I take it you were listening at work, Durante said. Dr. Curry has every channel that's working on this running continuously in both the hot and cold zones, Sophia said, shrugging. So yeah, I picked up a little. More than I can talk about in the car. He's got the updated spread graph, for one thing. The one that's way ahead of the news. Can I ask? The driver said, then paused. It's getting worse, Sophia said, after a glance at Durante. Lots worse. The thing is... The virus is molecularly, spit and bailing wire is the way that Dr. Curry described it. After a while, it's just going to burn itself out. Soon, Durante said. This was more than he'd been getting. Not soon enough, Sophia said with a sigh. Look, it's... The virus, the influenza one, is really complicated. It's a dualistic expression. That right there is way out there. And two centers, UCLA and College of Rome, have both come back with pretty good models showing that dualistic is impossible to support over the long term. Probably why it never evolved in microorganisms. There's some fundamental problems with it, chemically. And flus mutate. But the way that they mutate? They just mutate. They can get more lethal, more infective, or less lethal, less infective. Stop being infective or lethal at all, or any combination. This one, the real killer, is the beta expressor, the zombie virus embedded in the flu. CDC and Pasteur both ran models of it over multiple replications, and it just breaks pretty quick. It doesn't mutate to be more lethal or more infective. It stops working at all, except as a mild flu bug it stops being able to express the zombie part. So the plague's just going to stop? The driver asked. Yes, Sophia said, but it's not going to be soon enough. Look, you buy a new computer, and you don't know it, but there's something wrong with it. Every time you turn it on, one little random bit of software goes wrong. Now a computer can go a long time like that, or it can break the first time you turn it on. It's random. That's what's happening with all the flu viruses. As they replicate, sometimes they break, or get closer to breaking. As more and more break, the flu will burn out. The question is, 
if it will burn out before it kills the world. And the zombie part? Durante asked. We're getting a lot of transmission from bites now. Yeah, Sophia said grimly. They've broken out the transmission graphs by bite or flu. And bite, or at least blood transmission, is starting to pull ahead of flu. There was one case in South Carolina where a husband apparently gave it to his wife through, well, fooling around. Then he zombied but didn't bite her. She hid in the bathroom and she had no flu antibodies, so they think it was sexually transmitted. And then she zombied. Ouch, Faith said, shuddering. The beta expressor isn't really robust either, Sophia said. There are four different models that people are arguing over, but it looks as if it's going to slowly degrade back to basically rabies or just fall apart. Like I said, spit and bailing wire. And with that, we're at the condo, Durante said, as the driver pulled up to the entrance. Don't wait for me. I'll find my own way back. Yes, sir, the driver said. Dibs on the shower, Faith said. Age before incompetence, Sophia replied. This is going to be so much fun, Durante said. That was another segment in our complete audiobook serialization of Under a Graveyard Sky by John Ringo. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to audible.com. And thanks to podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. And a giant tower of tarot cards containing only the Eight of Wands that reaches all the way into the stratosphere, and even higher if you put it on a giant Uno deck that has only turn turnaround cards engaged in a recursive grumbling session, plus flowers and ashes from the fires of the forges of Never and Forever to Lois McMaster Bujold, Wen Spencer, and Brendan Dubois. Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy and keep reaching for the stars. The Bane Free Radio Hour is brought to you by Bane Books Audio Drama, presenting dramatized audio plays of the best science fiction and fantasy with a professional cast and cinema quality soundtracks. Now available, Eric Flint's Islands, based on the novella by Eric Flint. Also available, Larry Correa's Detroit Christmas, based on the novella by Larry Correa, set in the world of the Grim Noir Chronicles at BaneEbooks.com. Just put Islands and Detroit Christmas in the search bar and enter a world of listening pleasure. Bane Books Audio Drama. Thank you.